I grew up on a farm in northwest Missouri, about 300 miles west of here. There were seven children in the farm. We produced all of our own food. Food was a gift. It was a gift from nature. It was a gift to be given to others. We had a small house. We collected our rain water and used it for drinking water. We also, we didn't have indoor plumbing. We had a wood stove that we used in the winter. And in fact, we didn't have much money. Every year, my father struggled to pay the mortgage. And when I was 15, he was killed in an accident on the farm. As the oldest kid in the family still there, the oldest son, I had a lot of responsibilities at that point. And I suddenly became a prize scholarship student. I had a chance to get out. And I took the scholarship and never looked back. My freshman year in college, I studied archaeology, and I wanted to see if I would like to become an archaeologist. I went to Arkansas, worked on Indian mounds like this, excavating them in fields of soy, corn, and cotton, using tiny little trowels, tiny little dental equipment, and little, little brushes. Very hot, a lot of digging. Wasn't much different than what I was used to. Went back to college my sophomore year. Going to get a little further away next summer. Went to southern Mexico. Lived in an Indian village. I wanted to talk about kinship, sacred rotter holes, belief systems. They thought talking was fine. But for every hour that they talked to me, they had an hour less that they worked in their fields. So they thought it was fine that I helped them hoe their corn. This wasn't working. <laughs> Fast forward through an academic career, exit academia, move into the real world. I decide I'm going to work in human rights, and I start working with refugees. So, hmm, do you know who most refugees are? Farmers. What do they want to talk about? How they lost their land. Why they didn't have a crop. How much seed it would take to get them to go back what they'd have to pay for it, when the rains start, when they need to get back, how long it would take to walk back, etc. This really just wasn't working. I finally realized that I had to embrace this. And so I started talking to farmers. And I started creating markets for farmers. And I started talking to traders and companies. I've worked on six continents with the entire supply chain of agriculture. And I'd like to talk to you tonight about what I've learned. In the next 40 years, we have to produce as much food as we have in the last 8,000. And we have to do it in a way that we still have this planet. And we can't get away from the math. Population times consumption has got to equal the planet, and today it doesn't. In fact, it's at about 1.5 planets, which means we're living off the principal rather than the interest. We are quite literally eating the planet. Agriculture is the biggest threat, and we've got to figure out how to address it. It's the leading cause of deforestation. It's the leading cause of water use and water contamination. The biggest cause of pollution, the biggest user of chemicals. The biggest source of greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide and carbon released into the atmosphere. And in the last 150 years, it's caused us to lose half of our topsoil. Not a very pretty picture. We're using a third of the planet today to grow food and to grow livestock. We can't use the deserts. We can't use the mountains, lakes, rivers, and streams. We can't use the urban areas and all of the highways. Hopefully, we won't use the national parks. So we've got about 30% left of the planet that we can begin to use to grow food. So what are we going to do? We're using land right now, clearing habitat at about 0.6 of 1% a year. If we go forward at this rate, if we don't change the trajectory, over the next 40 years, 
we will in fact clear 24% more of the land. And it will look like this. This is the frontier between farming and nature. This happens to be Brazil, but it could be on many different continents. So we've got to freeze the footprint of food, and we've got to do it pretty fast if we want any biodiversity left in ecosystem services. World Wildlife Fund works to conserve biodiversity and the services it provides all of us. We don't have the ability to work everywhere in the world. We need to focus. So we've selected the 35 places that are the most important from a biodiversity point of view. And then we've looked at those places and tried to figure out what are the biggest threats. Turns out it's 15 commodities. And of these commodities, most are food. If we don't get food right in terms of where we grow it and how we grow it, we won't have a planet. So we've got to work with the food system. We've got to work with the value chain. So we took it apart. Where do we go? How do we work with it? Do we work with 6.9 billion consumers? 6,000 languages, take five to 10 seconds to make a choice. Pretty hard to influence that kind of group. Do we work with 1.5 billion producers? Again, we're mostly environmentalists. We're probably not the group to work with farmers. Or do we work with three to 500 companies that control 70% or more of the trade of each of the commodities we care about? And we decided we were gonna take the latter approach. Now, what we found when we actually started doing research on which companies are involved is that you see that the companies are the same. They start showing up under different columns. There's Cargill here, Cargill there. Cargill's kind of everywhere on this map. But there are other companies too. And what we discovered was that 100 companies control 25% of the trade of all 15 of the commodities that we care about. In fact, as we dig deeper, it's probably even less than that. Well, we can work with 100 companies. We can actually make that happen. In fact, we've signed MOUs to begin work with 40 of those 100 companies. And we have MOUs in the pipeline to work with another 40 companies. By 2050, 9 billion people. We may need twice as much food as we have today. How are we going to get there? There are multiple solutions and multiple strategies that we have to pursue simultaneously. We've identified nine, which are these right here. In 18 minutes, I can't really do justice to nine. I'm going to try to do four, and we'll see how far we get. Currently, we waste one out of every three calories that we produce. What does that mean? It means that if we could stop wasting food, we wouldn't have to produce as much and we'd still be able to feed nine billion people. So reducing waste is important. Where's the waste? In developing countries, it's in infrastructure, it's storage, it's in uh, lack of refrigeration, it's how things are moved. But in our own society, it's in the retail area, it's in the post-consumer area, it's in the restaurants. We throw away a lot of food. Half of all fresh produce is thrown away. In Japan, half of produce is rejected at the farm gate because it's not perfect. We need to get over ourselves. We've got to start figuring out how to save and use food better. Sell by doesn't mean spoil by. What would you give for a little machine that somebody could miniaturize that could tell you whether the leftover Chinese in your fridge is any good or not? whether the lasagna from a week ago is still edible or not, without killing you. We could save a lot, and it probably wouldn't cost 100 bucks, so somebody needs to invent it. Maybe you will. We have an expression in Missouri that goes something like, dance with the one that brung you. Genetics got us here. It's been responsible for producing food for 8,000 years, selecting crops, selecting traits, it's very important. We shouldn't take it off the table. But genetics isn't just GMOs. In fact, it's not even mostly GMOs. 
Genetics is about plant breeding. It's about hybrids. It's about selecting traits. We need to begin to look at this issue seriously. In the US, hybrids have quadrupled the production of corn. In most of the world, we don't use hybrids to produce corn yet. So production is down at the level on the left. 10 crops provide 80% of the calories on the planet today. It's not animals, guys, it's crops. 80%. Only two of them are scheduled to double in productivity by 2050, which is what we need to do on average across all food systems. We need to stop focusing on crops that are grown in Europe and the US and focus on crops that are grown in Africa and South Asia, where the population and the demand is going to be in the future. So with genetics from genetic engineering and using genomes of the crops that we care about, we can select for productivity, disease resistant, drought tolerance, nutritional traits. We can get all that. And we need to start. We need to focus on orphan crops, those crops that receive very little attention from researchers because there's not money in it, and yet are very important for food security in many parts of the world. One such crop is bananas. Bananas produce 20 times more calorie per hectare of land than corn in Iowa. Why aren't we focusing more on bananas and other crops that are equally productive? Mars and World Wildlife Fund are in fact going to create a project to map the genome of 10 orphan crops in Africa to address food security issues there. Why is Mars interested in genetics? Because they have found that 20% of the trees in a cocoa plantation produce 80% of the crop. They've also found that half of the pods in a cocoa plantation are dropped during the dry season. So if they can develop a way to look at productivity, to look at drought tolerance, they think that they can produce 320% as much cocoa on 40% of the land. That's more than doubling it. Now, Mars isn't a genetics company. They don't want to own these materials. They're putting them in the public domain because they want people to work on cocoa to make it more productive. But Mars has made a commitment that all the cocoa they buy will be certified by 2020 as sustainable. But they won't buy certified poverty. If the productivity of farmers is too low, they can't make a living, even if they can find somebody that will certify them. So Mars's work on productivity is to help farmers produce two, three, four times as much. Mars doesn't think 300 kilos a hectare is suitable for cocoa. It needs to be 1,200. And they want certification to be focused on 1,200. Today's technology, we use about 70% of the water that's used by humans for agriculture. We've got a lot of water scarcity around the world. It's going to get worse. We need to use technologies that give us more crop per drop. But which are those technologies? Currently, it takes about one liter of water to make one calorie of food. If your diet's 3,000 calories, that's about 3,000 liters of water. Which technology is better? Is it flood irrigation? Is it furrow irrigation? Center pivot or drip? It's not an obvious answer. It depends. It depends on the crop. It depends on the conditions. Better practices. The better farmers in the world produce 100 times more than the worst farmers. We need to understand that, and we need to use that. But which is going to produce more for us, focusing on the better farmers or focusing on the rest? We need to move the bottom. It's cheaper. We have the technology. We know how to do it. If we move the bottom, we will increase production more and will reduce environmental impacts more. So IKEA is now working with World Wildlife Fund to, in fact, improve cotton production around the world. Why does IKEA care about cotton? Because they're one of the largest buyers of cotton on the planet. 
Why does World Wildlife Fund care about cotton? Because it uses more pesticides than any other plant grown by people. We started working with 450 farmers. We're up to 60,000 today. They've reduced their water and pesticide use by half and increased their profits by 40%. Next year, IKEA will have 25% of all their crop coming from growers like these. Why do the growers produce for IKEA? Because IKEA guarantees them a market. Unilever is doing the same thing. Unilever is working with produces toothpaste. Instead of buying imported ingredients from abroad, they're buying a filler from Indonesia. It's made from cassava, like this, turned into a tapioca-like substance which is used to make toothpaste. It's the main ingredient. By making this simple choice, they now create 35,000 full-time jobs for farmers just in Indonesia, just in one product line. Unilever only has 3,000 employees in Indonesia as a company. And they're not just doing it in Indonesia, they're also doing it with cucumbers uh, and other products in India. This particular project employs 7,000 people where they've reduced chemical use by 78%, doubled yield, and improved quality. Unilever's not just focusing on one or two crops, they're looking more broadly. On November 15th, Unilever is going to make a commitment that 100% of all their natural ingredients will come from sustainable sources. They only know how that's going to happen for about 80% of their raw materials at this point. They don't know how the rest is going to, to, to play out. It's a leap of faith, and they know they can't do it by themselves. So they're looking for other companies to work with. The thing is, we know how to produce all commodities in greater abundance with fewer inputs. Companies like IKEA, Mars, and Unilever have shown the way. 100 companies can push 50% of production around the world to more sustainable levels. Producers can take advantage of that and sell their products, and we can support those producers by buying them. This is one small way that we can feed 9 billion people and maintain a living planet. Thank you.